How do we do? We're about to find out. Okay. Why is it that this is such an antique machine or something? I don't know. Because we ran it on your laptop. Yeah. We ran it. So and bizarre. Do you want to switch out laptop, Sebastian? I I, tr I mean, this flash drive didn't work on a different laptop either. Okay. For some reason it's... Um, but it, yeah, it was working on mine. I was just using it over there. Um, Weird. That's okay as long as we get it over here. So okay. Okay. You guys are you guys are on. Okay. Well, I just turned it into a PDF too, just in case I'm not That is it. Great. Okay, we have a clicker that works. Okay. All the images work. Did we get all the images to work, Nori? Uh, I have a check. Okay. I'm going to buzz through them real quick then. Seeing images. Go fast enough, nobody can see what we're doing. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're in good shape. Yep. Yeah, I think we're in good shape. Okay. Hi. Oh. 
It's mine. So I've got my own mic apparently tonight. Um, so I can be anywhere. This You're one's man. well, apparently. I don't think that's true, but um, I guess that way if I'm across the room and I want to remind somebody of something, I can. <laughs>
Yo, yo, it's Carolyn and Jessica to meet your partner. Uh, So it's five o'clock. What do you think? Should we should we launch? Okay, I think we kind of have to. Just coming in. That's all. Yeah. All right, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started just because we got a lot to get through this evening, and uh, we want to make sure we can cover it all. So. If I get you guys to wrap up your conversations, I do not have a wine glass or a champagne glass that I can hit with a knife. I wish I did. Apparently, that's the only thing to get a group of people to stop talking. Hi, everybody. Oh, it's a little better. I guess you got to get closer to the mic. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We're going to get started right on time tonight because we got a lot to get through. Um, thank you all. Welcome. Um, thank you for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Brandon Swanson. I'm the Director of Community Planning and Building here in the city. Um, and this is Design Traditions 1.5. It's our second uh, set of community workshops. We're just doing one workshop this time around. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, bathrooms right outside there, across the hallway. If you need to use them anytime, please help yourself. If you need to go outside and get a, a bit of fresh air, that's fine too. This is a mask on meeting. Uh, right now, the city still does have uh, that proclamation in place. Tomorrow it is on the city council agenda, possibly to remove the requirement for public meetings to have masks, but that is still in place. So tonight we're enforcing that still. Um, we're gonna move pretty fast tonight, not so fast that you can't keep up, but uh, you'll notice once we start handing it out, we have a thing tonight called uh, personal workbook. And this is, you don't have this yet, so don't look for it. Uh, we'll hand it out later. But this is what tonight's all about. We're looking for individual feedback on certain things. The main reason we're here tonight is we've worked with Nori and the steering committee and my team, and we've compiled all the stuff that we heard in the first two community workshops, the online survey, individual emails, phone calls, people talking to us on the street. We've compiled all that into a direction. Think about the direction that the ship is going. This direction has been compiled, and that's what we think we're going to be doing in this next step of actually writing the draft updates to the guidelines. So tonight, before we put pen to paper as a team, we want to make sure that we're on the right track. This whole process is about getting the community involved. And so we want to make sure that we heard you all correctly over however many months we've been doing this. So that's part of what we're trying to get back tonight. And that's why it's important to get individual feedback on this. Um, what, the way this format's going to go, and Nori's going to walk you through this too, because it's so important that everyone understands it. You're going to get a little bit of time for every exercise. You're probably not going to finish every exercise. This is a take-home piece of equipment. So don't think you have to finish this tonight. You get to take it home, finish it up, and you can turn it in like homework to City Hall. Take us all back to school. It's a fun little exercise for you all. Um, so that's what's going on tonight. The facilitators are the folks walking around in colored vests tonight. There's going to be one at every table. 
they'll help, help keep everybody on track, let you know where we're at in the process. It's not going to be like the first workshop. There's not going to be a ton of table work. You're not going to be working with each other necessarily at your table. There may be a couple of exercises where we ask you to talk for a couple of minutes, but for the most part, it's going to be on your own doing your work. Um, so I want to just do a quick thank you to the whole Design Traditions team, uh, my staff at the city, Nori and his team, our steering committee, uh, many of whom are here. So if you're on that team, just raise your hand really quick. Uh, let everybody see who you are. Don, get your hand up there. We've got all of our staff around here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming tonight. Um, we have some of our elected and appointed officials here tonight. This is open to them. So thank you to those that have come out uh, to observe this tonight. And most importantly, thank you to all of you, the community, because I look at you as part of the design traditions team as well. I mean, this is meant to be the updates for the village, for those of us, uh, those of you that live here, uh, these are your updates. So thank you so much for your time in doing this. Um, so I went through the purpose. Uh, I'm gonna run through these slides really, really quick. I kind of just babbled through and I think I covered most of this already. Uh, you can see the project scope is up on here. We're doing both the residential and commercial design guidelines. We're also updating the zoning code. The zoning code, think of that as the implementing arm of this project. So the design guidelines are what things should look like. The zoning code is how tall something is. It's the more measurable uh, codified law that goes along with the, zone, with the design guidelines. So like I said, we're going to be going through this with the community the whole time. I went through the project team. We've got our staff, the city, Winter and Company, the steering committee, and a big one on here is also the city uh, residents. Really, they're part of the, both the stakeholder group and the working team because we get so much good feedback from the community. Uh, we're also going to be going pretty soon to both the Planning Commission, City Council, and the HRB as well uh, to start getting feedback on the drafts as we get further along. So we'll be at Planning Commission this month, City Council next month to provide them with an update on what we hear tonight and what we've been hearing from the community as a whole. Uh, so you can see the schedule. It's pretty aggressive, but we've been on track so far, and I have every confidence we're going to remain that way. Uh, you can see where we're at in the process right now. We're confirming that project direction. Uh, we had uh, completion by October 20th, so we're going to leave here October 3rd, and we're going to do some work after we get your feedback and confirm that direction, and then we're going to be at the Planning Commission and the City Council after that, and we'll start actually drafting the regulations come November. And once we get those drafts done, we'll be back in December for another one of these community meetings and hopefully you all come, uh, roll those out in a you know red line version. You can see what we've been doing. And then we'll start going through the process of modifying as needed and talking to our city council and our planning commission again about it. Ultimately, our goal is to have these things adopted by our city in March of 2023. They'll still have to go to the Coastal Commission after that. But once we've we've got them done in the city, that's that's the biggest hurdle, I think. Uh, you know, we're going to be talking to the Coastal Commission along the way, and they're not too concerned about design. Their biggest concern is access, uh, public access and things like that. Uh, so community engagement, I talked about, you know, our next workshop is going to be in December. You're also going to have opportunities at the Planning Commission meetings and City Council meetings. And with that, I am going to turn it over to the man, the myth, the legend, Nori Winters. There's your stuff right there. Thank you, and and good evening. Um, do I dare? Can I lift this up to the podium? This computer. Uh, the cable is taped down. So you can... Oh, I can't. Okay. okay. I can make it happen. All right. It'll be easier for me to read there. Rather, if I turn like this, the people watching online are going to only hear fragments of my conversation as I try to read the slides. Um, we're starting off with our IT shuffle that we did last time too Great. already. That's Great. Great. Thank Thanks a lot. Um, as Brandon mentioned, we um, have a handbook, we're calling it, that we're asking you to work with this evening and it will be passed out shortly. And it will, you can make notes on it tonight, but really this is sort of the reader's guide introduction to the strategy paper that outlines our approach to improving the design guidelines and the zoning code. And the handbook focuses on some of the major lingering questions or ones that we want to drill down on more. I will be explaining what we've learned so far and going over what has happened in the previous workshop in the online survey. 
And if you do take it home, we'd like to have it back by October 10th. Uh, but that's, you know, a soft deadline if you need more time. But that will help us in terms of staying on schedule, in terms of analyzing the information that, that we collect in the handbook. It is also available online through the city's homepage. It is downloadable, and it's also a fillable form, so that if you prefer to pull it off and fill it in online, you can do that and print it out. So it's available in a variety of of, of media, if you will. And that is true for the strategy paper itself. It's That's not fillable, but it is uh, downloadable and, and available on, online for you. There are one or two copies of the, strat of the full strategy paper that are on the tables this evening for general reference, but we'll be walking through some of the key recommendations and findings in the paper, uh, as well as raising some of the questions. It's organized into these sections. The first ones address what we've learned in terms of what people value and of key uh, prints of key characteristics of the community that they value. And then also some of the high level design principles that we extracted from the feedback we've received so far. This is a short summary of some uh, issues and then how we respond to those issues uh, in terms of uh, we have a summary of some key recommendations. I'll present those, those in the slides this evening. Then there are more detailed recommendations, some addressing downtown and then the residential districts. Now, we'll get into this a little bit later, but downtown is not just ocean. It's the zoning districts that are uh, that include the commercial and mixed use and multifamily zone districts, and we'll show you a map of that. Residential in our parlance this evening and during this project has to do with the single family residential neighborhood. So there's a slight distinction there. Then we have some recommendations about the zoning code amend, uh, amendments, and then also uh, some recommendations for further study about how the review process is applied. There were some suggestions that came forward about that. Some high level improvements that we've learned we need to do. One is right now the residential guidelines are in two separate documents. We want to combine the two of them so they're easier to use and to consider all of the guidelines at one time, even though some still are relevant at a concept level. The way it's organized now is you have one book that you look at at a very concept level for a design, and then a second book you look at for details. That works pretty well, but there are times when you really should be looking at both of them, so we're going to combine them. Uh, we're going to develop a new downtown guideline book. The current guideline book is brief and uh, vague and needs much more detail. We're going to add more cross-references to other codes and regulations that are, will help people understand the interface between the guidelines and other rules of the city and improve wayfinding. That is to help you say, okay, I need to jump to a certain section or topic. How do I do that within the guidelines documents? So these are structural recommendations, not necessarily the content recommendations we'll be getting into. Uh, adding more visual examples to uh, what we've heard is in many cases right now, the guidelines may have only one picture of something that is considered to be appropriate and or the picture it isn't even clear, is that an appropriate example or an inappropriate example? So uh, these are some of the kinds of refinements to the way the material is presented that we will be working on. And then also uh, getting into some specific topics like how do you rep define context and dealing with the right of way, the ROW is the public right of way how that is, it's intended to be landscaped, but isn't always. Now, the edits to the design guidelines documents are generally grouped into three categories. One is to illustrate something that's already there that makes sense and that is still valid, but needs clear visuals. Uh, another is that something needs to be expanded or new information needs to be provided. For example, as we're now dealing with climate change, there are concerns about new materials, there are concerns about using heat pumps, things that were never addressed 20 years ago when the guidelines were first written. And then there may be some where there is a guideline that now needs to change. Uh, current guideline, for example, discourages the use of metal roofs. Well, that's a question today, given fire concerns. Uh, are there times when that would be an appropriate response? This is an example of what an updated 
pair of pages would look like in the residential design guidelines. Here is an example on the left of a page of a grid of photographs of showing many examples of what would be appropriate or inappropriate, if you will. And generally speaking, we will be using inappropriate examples from just outside the city limits. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best not to embarrass or insult. Uh, uh, and then in some cases, we will be updating within the original document with new photographs, as you see on the right right hand page, and certainly clarifying and strengthening language as needed. Some of the other recommendations uh, are there may be some guidelines that need to be codified, that is, they need to be moved over into the zoning code, where it's more of a yes or no or a measurable answer. And we're still looking at that, and that'll sort of happen more as the editing of the guidelines evolves. Another one is, should there be a design review board reestablished? And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail here. Um, but particularly the need to schedule regular training for whoever is conducting design review, whether that's the planning commission, the review board, or staff. And then one of the specific zoning code amendments we're going to talk about tonight is perhaps changing the measure that is used to control the overall three-dimensional volume of a building. Volumetrics is the highfalutin term we get paid extra to use, uh, but it basically means that the early regulations were set up to try to control volume that may not be achieving its desired effects and is proven to be difficult to administer. Are there alternatives? We want to look at one of those tonight. Uh, and also just to clarify, in some cases, what do we mean by what is height? Where, how is it measured? Some of the current diagrams are a bit vague. Now, this all came about from you, from the meetings that we've had along the way that Brandon uh, alluded to. And I'm going to particularly highlight some of the findings from the first round of workshops and the online survey uh, this evening. Uh, what did we learn in the first set of workshops? Those were two. One evening was for downtown and one evening was for the residential areas. In general, at a very high level, context makes a difference. Some things work in one part or one block, but not in another. And we can get into detail about how con what context means, but it's that overall setting of what's going on around you in terms of buildings and landscapes, street character, views, any number of what we would call design variables can influence the context and how you perceive a building. But also that the interface with the landscaping is very important. The foreground landscaping we learned is really, really important in terms of how it maintains the sense of a forest character. The interaction of some basic design variables influence that sense of cap compatibility, and we'll get into that in more detail. But for example, the overall massing of a building or the materials that are used are a couple of those variables that make a big difference. Uh, the landscapes that reinforce the forest setting are very highly valued, and that has come through loud and clear. Not surprisingly, but it's good to have that confirmation. But also attention to detail, that is architectural detail, landscape detail, a sense of craftsmanship of high quality is very important as well. Um, in the early workshop on residential, we had four categories of topics that you worked on. One was to identify your favorite streets in town. Another one was to evaluate some different buildings, houses, and whether or not they would fit appropriately in Carmel. And most of them were selected from out of Carmel that time around. The character of front yards, informal, formal, dense, not so dense. And then the character of the right of way, which is more of what sometimes may, you may think is a front yard, but it's really the city's land in front of the front yard. This is a composite map of the individual tables that mapped their favorite streets. And so what is highlighted in red on this map are those that were repeatedly shown on several tables. 
end with some of the key comments summarized. Now, you're not going to be able to read this here tonight, but what did we find? Each neighborhood has at least one favorite street. Now, certainly there's several in the golden rectangle, uh, perhaps to be expected, but every part of town has something that's valued. The quality of the tree canopy is a factor that people commented on. The front yard landscapes were a key variable that people commented on. A sense of human scale, where there were views, sometimes of the ocean, but other times to a canyon or even down a street. And also the diversity in the architecture came up frequently as a characteristic that people valued along the way. So what's interesting is we conducted this activity 20 some odd years ago when we first wrote the design guidelines and this map almost exactly matches the one from 20 years ago. What does that mean? There's a continuity of values here that is important to recognize and respect. Um, then out of the, uh, there were a series of activities where people commented on those houses and here are just a couple of the sheets. Um, and what were some of the terms people were using that they were commenting on? The size of the building, its overall height and width, was it in scale or not? What was the percentage of window to wall? Those that had blank walls didn't do as well as those that had windows that faced the street and, and connect you to the neighborhood. Uh, building materials were commented on, roof form, flat, pitched, very steep, not pitched, slat, shallow, etc. The color of the buildings themselves. Uh, the proportions of them, did they have a more vertical emphasis emphasizing their height or did they tend to hug the ground to be lower scaled kinds of buildings? And what were their overall uh, uh, proportions and landscapes? So these are some of the key terms that people use. And so we're going to be using those now with you again this evening, but expanded a little bit. Out of that, what did we see that people preferred? front walls of buildings that had some variation in depth, not really overly busy, but enough to give a sense of scale and interest. Uh, generally, a lower front facade, a one-story element in front tended to be the house, those rated better. Those with sloped roofs were more popular. Those that had a muted color as the primary color were more popular. Those that had that balance of a ratio of window to wall uh, were preferred, and those were the consistent use of traditional materials. That is, they weren't applied in a fake way. They had a sense of authenticity to them, and that there was sufficient landscaping in front. These are all some of the preferred features. Some of the least preferred, the less favored, were the converse of some of those same variables. Large, flat front walls, large surfaces of a single material with no relief, a full two stories in front, that particularly when it was highly exposed in combination with a landscape that wasn't lush or filtered views. So the interface of landscape and tall building was an important one that we saw in some of the responses. Uh, flat roofs, particularly those on a two story did less well. And uh, light colors generally, again, if, if it was on a large two story building, the light color didn't do as well and those that didn't have much landscaping in front. Uh, so that then the next activity was front yards. And those that were preferred were those that had that, that continued the sense of village in the forest. They used traditional plant materials. They were informally organized. The yards had a layered effect, you know, filtered viewing through of some tall, some low shrubs, uh, and not a, a, a trimmed, or a opaque uh, landscape. And, uh, but there were differences certainly on scenic uh, and in some of the streets near the mission that were annexed later and uh, have a different landscape tradition uh, were different and those were recognized as, as such. Um, that was some of the workshop findings. Now that then was followed with the online survey and we had 331 respondents, which is a very good response rate. And uh, we really thank you all that took the time to, to get involved in that. And the topics here are what we saw, the forest character, architectural style, roof form, building massing, et cetera. Here are a few of the survey responses. Forest character, how important is it to maintain uh, forest character? 
people had the option of saying they strongly agreed, somewhat agreed, weren't sure, uh, somewhat disagreed, and strongly disagreed. Here you see the percentages of those who strongly agree, 41 plus, 37 plus for somewhat. When you combine those, understanding that some of those are somewhats, you have uh, well over 75% of the people saying forest character is important to us in some, at some degree. Important piece of information. And it means we need to really look at the, those landscape guidelines and be certain they are doing their job in promoting that. We asked about roofs, pitched roofs. Uh, this one is a little uh, less clear uh, because this is not just a majority rule, 51% kind of thing wins the, wins the lottery. Here we have uh, a majority agreeing, but also a fair number not so sure that a pitched roof has to be or, or is essential there uh, for the primary roof form. So this one needs more explanation. Why, when, how, how big, what slope, what character, how does it fit? There are a lot more details perhaps that may influence when is an, a pitched roof essential or not. Um, another question was a new house can fit in regardless of its style if it meets some of these very fundamental design variables in terms of scale and color and materials, et cetera. And uh, two thirds of the people agree to some degree that a new house can fit in regardless of style if it meets those variables. Now, if it meets those variables is, is a key uh, caveat, if you will. Well, uh, but we do have a third sort of saying, not so sure about this. So this is another one we need to drill down on and we're gonna be asking you about that tonight. Uh, another one about building massing. This one related to downtown, there were activities that looked at how a larger new building that maybe occupies more than one lot can fit in if it has some variation in its massing. And uh, the respondents felt pretty comfortable about that a, a building can fit in as long as it is divided into modules, if you will, that fit scale. Uh, there was also discussion about alternative materials. And a high number of people have said in the context of downtown uh, that alternative materials could be considered as long as they had texture and character that was similar to traditional materials, conveyed a sense of craftsmanship, if you will. Now, we're getting ready to lead into a couple of the activities for you. That's sort of the high level overview of, of what we've learned and why we're asking the questions of you tonight. This text will appear in the handbook you're going to get in a minute. There are a series of characteristics that are highly valued. And this is language some of you will recognize your words. This is an amalgam of different comments that have come to us in a variety of ways. Carmel is a village in the forest which is subdued. No one thing is attention grabbing. It's exploratory. There is a sense of discovery along each street. You have to walk along and look here and look there to see things. It's not a full frontal exposure. Um, historic, there's a rich mix of historic and traditional buildings that represent a range of styles throughout the area. In terms of architecture, it's a village in a forest where it's genuine. There's a sense of authenticity uh, with natural building materials. The buildings are in scale, they're human scaled. They are crafted. They have a high sense of quality of materials and durability. They are diverse in the range of building styles that fit in. Uh, so they, they fit in, a, in a, a variety of ways, but they're also nestled. They fit into and are subordinate to that forest setting. In terms of the landscapes themselves, the, uh, it's a village in the forest with landscapes that, are, that contribute to forest character that are walkable, that are pedestrian scaled, and that connect the public way with the private realm. There's not a harsh dividing line between a property. And in terms of downtown, it's pedestrian friendly and buildings are human scaled again, and they're opening and welcoming with a variety of things going on. So those are the first characteristics that we're gonna be asking you to look at, but I don't want you to get started yet and you're not gonna get your handbook just yet because in order to save time in terms of presentations, I'm going to introduce two activities 
And then we're going to ask you to start doing a little bit of work. But the first one has these questions about that list of features I just gave you and your overall reaction. Does that seem to capture the essence of Carmel or not? And if so, how would you edit them? And this one you certainly may want to take home and work on. That's fine. But you may have some immediate reactions this evening or at least some questions to ask. When you do get started, we're going to give you five minutes to talk with your table. And again, it's not to reach a consensus. It's just, if you have an opinion, we want to hear it. That may help me answer my questions as I want to think, know what other people are, are thinking. And then you'll have about five minutes to answer the questions yourselves and or to go in and start editing those, those uh, draft uh, key features. Now, the second activity immediately following that are these high level design principles, again, extracted from what we learned before. Number one, maintain a healthy forest character. Number two, enhance the forest. And that's written to mean that in some cases, uh, there's been some loss of forest character. And, and we want to reestablish that to the extent we can within current constraints of drought tolerance and fire considerations, et cetera. All of that can be addressed. Keep it modest and uh, respect historic precedents. Defer to them in terms of those that are around you and certainly preserve them. Uh, that exist. The fifth one is fit with context. And these are the some of the key variables that you're going to be also working on in a later activity here. Fifth, pay attention to detail. And six, encourage a compatible diversity in design. Now, most of these are flipping around those features we saw earlier and turning them into principles, but they don't necessarily match up parallel one-to-one. -one. So that second activity will be to to ask you, did we capture those key principles accurately? And uh, if not, how would you edit them? Or what would you add? So given this now, it's time to pass out the handbooks, if you will. And the first question backing up, there, there's an introductory page where you can add your name, et cetera, and fill that in. But the first activity page you will see is page number three to go to. And preceding that will be that list of the characteristics. You can look at that again. And for the act first activity, we're not really asking the table to discuss it. That's just for individuals to respond to. And we'll give you about 10 minutes to look at that and do some initial editing. After that, we'll signal it's time to move on to that second activity which looks at those key principles. Just a little reminder for everybody. So there are a couple of those uh, strategy papers on every table. Those are meant to be shared. Um, so that when you showed up, there was two strategy papers on the table. So just make sure that those are shared uh, amongst yourself. We'll use our sharing skills. Uh, if, if we need a couple more of those, raise your hand, let us know, let one of the facilitators know, we'll get you more, but those are meant to be shared among the table as you work through these uh, workbooks. I have that when they have we didn't update but 
Oh, no, I just wanted to uh, try to get rid of this uh, ugly Zoom bar here. Just uh, just annoys me. Okay, there we go. It's out of the way.
Okay, it's time to move on to activity two. Of course, the activity one, you weren't talking. It was all just doing it yourselves. Ha ha. <laughs> uh, so you should be on to that second one, which is now looking at the design principles. And some of you may already have been working on that. I'm not looking. And Nori, what page are we going to find that activity number two on? Five. Page five, everybody. And once again, don't stress out. You do not have to finish this workbook tonight. We're happy to collect this as your homework here in the, uh, by next Friday. So you have plenty of time. So what we've timed here is for about 10 minutes for table discussion. Again, to go around, express your thoughts uh, about the uh, the design principles which are in the document preceding that, and then a five minutes of writing down your thoughts or making notes or asking a question if you need, if you want. Thank you. 
I'm going to, I want to do a time check here. It looks like a lot of you are kind of finished or are going to wait and do the editing uh, later because we still have six minutes allocated to this activity, but I'm wondering, uh, should we move on and you'll come back and do this later on? I'm seeing someone saying, yes, let's move on. All right. Is that okay with everyone else? Or so? All right. We're going to stop the clock here. I'm never ever complained about doing something sooner and we could get out of here earlier. Okay, we're moving into the second segment of this evening and this gets fun about residential design and we're gonna be doing two activities which you probably previewed, but I wanna introduce those to you here a little bit. And one is considering those key design variables and how they influence whether something fits in Carmel or not. And then the second one is a more direct question about historic styles and whether they are uh, how we promote them, uh, facilitate them, or require them. So uh, before that, though, some of the other recommendations specific to the single family residential design guidelines um, are to clarify existing text about some topics that, although the text is pretty well written, from someone who wrote it 20 years ago, um, it still obviously in some cases needs updating or strengthening. And some of the areas are uh, what fitting in means, what being subordinate means. And another is addressing things such as solar access and views, which were addressed, but at a pretty high light level in the existing guidelines. And nowadays, of course, it's much more serious. And we have to take into consideration state regulations related to solar access. Uh, landscaping in the front yard, uh, dealing with driveway paving materials, and, and nowadays promoting the permeability, the porosity even more than we talked about earlier uh, for a variety of reasons, and using muted colors, uh, building forms, and addressing synthetic materials, particularly uh, use of stone. Now, some of those we're actually going to drill into this evening a little bit, and we want to uh, dig in deeper to that. What we did is we took, uh, in, from the survey, there was a question that said, can you name a house that you think was built relatively recently that fits in? And uh, staff worked diligently to go and track down all of those examples and photograph them for us. And that is what uh, is in the uh, upcoming exercise or photographs that citizens uh, nominated as, in their mind, fitting in. And it'll be interesting to see how you re respond to that. The design variables are the building size. It's overall size. Is it big, small, whatever? It's height in that front wall plane. The overall building form, is it simple? Is it complex? Is it a geodesic dome? Um, roof form, building materials, the windows, again, the the treatment of windows on the front of the building and the color. And then in terms of site design, the character of the front yard, but also the fence and the driveway treatment and the right of way, that, that public realm. Now, each photograph does not convey all of these variables. So in some cases you won't check it because it's not visible and you won't be commenting on it. That's fine, we just wanna hear uh, which ones you think fit in, kind of fit in, or don't fit. So you get three answer choices. 
for each of those design variables. And I think there are 12 uh, photos. So this, this one, we're gonna give you a fair amount of time to work on. And you can, I know you're gonna do it anyway, discuss it at your table. Uh, but again, you're not trying to get consensus on a photograph, just hear everyone else's opinions about that building and how it fits in. I want you to be thinking as designers, as design reviewers, what, what works about this design and what doesn't. Uh, so this is drilling a bit deeper than in the earlier workshop where it was sort of just a like it, a don't like it kind of responses. So we'll uh, be giving you roughly 25 minutes total, kind of breaking it down to 10 minutes of discussion and then 15 minutes individual filling out. But obviously you can color outside the lines. Um, the second activity related to that gets more specific about historic styles. And to what degree should we allow them, encourage them or require them? Uh, we wanna be certain there are no impediments. For example, are there code regulations that make it difficult to do a steeply pitched roof when that might be something that's desirable for a particular design? We've heard that as a question is something we wanna work on. We could remove that impediment, um, but that, so that's one kind of response. Uh, another is to really say, we, we really, really prefer that you do those and maybe there are ways of making it easier to work in a historic design, or would you literally require them? And uh, the, uh, the example on the right is actually an earlier publication we did 20 some odd years ago, summarizing some of the key characteristics of some of the historic styles in town. It never actually got officially published. Uh, but it, it may serve as a starting point. And the other starting point for helping to describe historic styles is the city's historic context statement, which is a more thorough document that is available online that describes the recognized historic styles that exist within the city today. So if we're going to discuss styles, we need to understand what the characteristics are of each one of those. What are some of the issues of requiring or really heavily promoting historic styles? Well, one of the questions is, well, which ones are you gonna choose? When, what's the cutoff line? Is it 1930, 1940, 1950? We, there are lots of people who would debate different years. And how accurately is it executed? If it's got a pitched roof and an arched doorway, did, is, does it qualify as Tudor? At what point is it not Tudor and just a, a weak uh, imitation? And what's the impact on reading the histories, the history of the community uh, in terms of doing that? On the other hand, um, those are some of the issues that one would have to address. On the other hand, uh, the, some of the appeals are that you can focus on a particular period of time and say, this is the period of focus for Carmel. This is who we want to be known for as, and we want to really promote that traditional image. Now, the current policies uh, promote a diversity of architectural styles if they fit in. And there's still that big if and whether or not that's been interpreted appropriately in every case is a, is, is a question that we want to drill into. Uh, but they talk about accommodating a variety of styles as long as they're exhibiting craftsmanship, scale, et cetera, those design variables. So uh, this could be a departure if, if indeed we want to have a much stronger statement about promoting historic styles for new construction. So th that's, a, that's a fun one to discuss, uh, but this mostly is one, at, because I think it's all gonna come out in the discussion of the, of the first one there, activity three. Uh, we want your opinion about how do we address historic styles. So those are the two activities for now. And the first one begins on page seven, and that's the series of photographs for you to go through. And again, you can fill them out this evening or do them later, but this is a good chance for you to discuss them at your table. We're not expecting agreement, and, uh, but we wanna hear what your individual opinions are. And the clock starts. <clears throat> I'm <laughs> 
So just a couple of little notes as we're walking around. As you're making your check marks on this page here, if you've got some notes, if there's something you want to write a little helpful note next to one of your check marks, by all means, please do that because we're going to read them all. We'll put them together. It's really helpful for us. That's one really helpful thing uh, for us. And just a reminder, we're doing activities three and four. So if you finish with number three, go ahead and move on to number four. But please don't move ahead. I see some people that are getting really excited and going on to five and six, and we haven't explained those quite yet. So if you can hold your excitement, we'll get to those soon. Left and roughly, yeah. Well, I think because they're they're not feeling panicked about finishing it yeah. this evening. This, so. um, this is a hot mic, so you know. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I didn't think you're going to be <laughs> Yeah, so I'm 
Yeah, just uh, really annoys me. No, you're right. Okay, we're good. It's about time to be moving on to four, question, activity four, the question about historic styles. Thank you. 
Okay, we're going to move on. Oops. <clears throat> 
into the third module this evening. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about downtown and then alternative building materials. You can obviously finish your workbook related to activities three and four uh, on your own. And again, to redefine what we mean by downtown, all of the colors here other than the pale yellow are downtown in the terminology that we're using. They include uh, the central commercial district, which focuses along ocean, but have several other blocks that have multifamily, have mixed commercial, limited commercial, a variety of other zone districts. So uh, multifamily, fits within this area because that's where the zoning district permits it. So some people may have said, oh, well, residential includes multifamily. The way we're using the two terms for this process is, is that uh, those are part of, of the downtown. And I just want to report some of what we've learned, what we're going to be doing in the update to the guidelines. Now, the downtown design guidelines have a different format they are much briefer than the existing residential design guidelines, and I would say operate at a pretty high level. Um, and they have some photographs, but very, very few illustrations. So uh, we know that we're going to be looking at a, a, a major update to those, but still working with the fundamental policies that are in there right now. Uh, what did we learn in the workshops in terms of people evaluating potential infill buildings for, for downtown? Um, uh, first, people told us about what was important to them. Architectural detail, compatible scale, a consistency in the design of a building. And that is, um, on the one hand, part of the conversation is about how to break down the appearance of a large mass of a building so that it fits into the finer grain scale but to do so in a way that is authentic and believable and not silly Disneyland. And so getting that appropriate balance, if you will, is a, is a key concept that we saw notes about in, on, on some of the worksheets. Uh, using high quality materials, including some traditional roof forms and muted earth tones showed up again. So out of that came some more specific focused principles for downtown. Um, and uh, one is to meet the key, those key design variables of size, the ratio of solid to void of windows, materials, et cetera, that you were just looking at for single family houses, but in the context of downtown, but also to, for those larger buildings. And when we're talking about larger, we're still talking about one and one. two story buildings, but larger in terms of they may be occupying more than one lot width. And how do you help that? maintain the sense of scale that exists in the community right now. High quality materials again, uh, well-crafted details, and particularly uh, assuring that the street level is, an, is appealing to pedestrians. That's a strong policy statement that exists in the guidelines today. But also the interplay of indoor and outdoor spaces, whether it's a courtyard, an alleyway, a walkway, or whatever, but that that interplay is a real... Uh, important characteristic, and and there are some guidelines about that, but they're pretty lightweight. Uh, and promoting the sense of discovery that I think we all love and value that's a part of downtown. Um, now, uh, we had an activity in which you evaluated some computer-generated models of alternative massing scenarios that included a combination of one and two-story elements some one-story elements in front, two stories in back, some that had a little bit of two-story in front in combination with one story, et cetera. We learned a lot from this activity. There were a lot of really good comments, even down to how it relates to the building next door, a tall building next to another tall building versus uh, moving that taller massing element over away from the other tall building and next to a smaller building so there was more variety going on. It was interesting interesting. Uh, information that we that we got out of that. So these are some of the observations that came out of that. Now, what you'll be seeing in some cases, we'll be using those computer models, plus some others that we'll be generating as new illustrations for a new format that will be following the format for the residential guidelines. And this is a mock-up, it's a draft, the, the text hasn't been vetted or anything like that, uh, but just an example of how 
the red box is the full extent of the guidance of this topic and the existing guidelines. And, uh, and so we're taking that one topic and creating at least a two page spread of the topic. And again, I know you can't read it here, but what we are doing is taking that and using it as a high level policy statement under which the more detailed guidelines will follow. So that language is being repeated in that first paragraph of this page. So this is the approach that we will be taking to expanding. So it's not changing policy, it's clarifying, it's building on what's already there. Um, now, uh, that's, it's a short, very short report on what we learned about downtown and how we're going to be moving forward that there is more detail in the in the strategy paper about downtown. We just didn't think we could put much more time into it this evening. Now, uh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Many, many more visuals, uh, photographs, diagrams, yes, yes. So you, again, you, you see an example here of, of us dropping in several photographs, some talking about the existing context and how to respond to it. Um, oh, and, and, and uh, something like this. Sorry, I don't want to step away from the mic for those of you who are joining us online. But the photograph on the left-hand page is a sample block here in town. And what we're doing is diagramming on top of that to show a couple of features to be thinking about in compatible infill. One is the sort of rhythm of the width of traditional buildings, of course, that are expressing traditional widths. So here you're seeing white vertical lines driving that home, that uh, buildings that express that rhythm will do a better job of fitting in. The other is that there is a separation generally between where there are second floors. First floors are more transparent, upper floors are more opaque with a smaller ratio of windows. And there is a line, generally a molding line or detailed in some other way that defines that separation. In the topography of downtown, what results is a stair-step effect of storefronts and of transparency or of that demarcation line. So at a skeletal framework level, we're beginning to show the, 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 the underlying features before you start thinking about style or materials and things like that, you're going to do a better job of fitting in if you are respecting those characteristics. So we're going to be visually illustrating those in there. So thank you for the question. Um, so moving yeah. on to materials, we want to uh, get your opinion about using alternative materials. And there are a variety of reasons for doing that. They were addressed earlier on and 20 some odd years ago, there were materials that we knew were like scratching on a chalkboard, uh, aluminum siding and vinyl siding are a couple of examples. It was pretty easy to make statements that those were gonna be inappropriate. But there are new materials that have appearances that are more similar to traditional materials. There are environmental reasons now, uh, perhaps for considering alternatives. Uh, and, and so that's one of the questions that has come up from you that we need to drill down into. So what some of the variables are, what type of material are we talking about? Is it stone, is it siding or whatever? What is its appearance and uh, its texture, the scale, the color, et cetera? How is it applied? Is it stuck on and look fake or does it have a sense of authenticity to it? And how well does it perform? Does it hold up or not? Will it age the way it should? Uh, and so a few of the very alternatives that we're gonna be asking about are stone and siding and roofing this evening. For example, there are what are called manufactured stone. They're basically a cast concrete product and they're created in a variety of ways and stained, et cetera, to simulate stone. There are other stones, authentic stone, other than Carmel stone. And is it appropriate to be considering those or not as getting Carmel stone, we understand may be becoming more difficult. Um, and some are cast products that uh, along the way. So some of the variables there have to do with the colors, the finish, 
Uh, is it an actual unit that is assembled and mortared the way conventional masonry is? Or is it a panel that you can tell looks like it's a panel? Those are details, and you're not going to get into those this evening. But the question is, should we consider those knowing that we would have to address those details or not? Uh, how it's used. It's used sometimes as a supporting wall. That is, masonry historically was the ground floor and lighter things were on top. And or it's the foundation for something like a storefront. Or sometimes it is the entire wall of a building. There are other applications, certainly in the landscape. And we heard in some individual comments of some of the worksheets that that was where a uh, stone was perhaps better, better used. But the existing guidelines uh, do uh, discourage, but uh, allow the application in some, uh, in some cases for, for alternatives. Uh, the other material to look at is siding. And one that you may be familiar with is fiber cement siding. The one of the well-known brand names is Hardy Siding, Hardy Plank. If you've heard of it, uh, it's made up of sawdust and concrete uh, cement, and it can be formed in a variety of materials. It is not a well; you can get it panelized, but it also comes as a unit, just like regular lumber does, in shingles and in 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 uh, lap siding. So these are examples of fiber, fiber cement siding, and they could be smooth finished or textured. Uh, these are examples actually, and I'm not suggesting that these are appropriate architecturally here at all, but these are all pulled off the web, hardy or fiber cement sided houses. And so the point here is the detailing. Uh, does it have that same sense of scale? Does it convey that, that, that sense of detail? Now it still may be inappropriate, but I want you to understand that there are these products out there that uh, may, may, we may want to be considering. If we got down to the, and if so, then we would get down into that detail that I've touched on in terms of how it's applied, et cetera, for a sense of authenticity. <clears throat> but just to re refresh your member, memory, the residential guidelines currently say to use natural materials, um, but the end to avoid synthetic materials. But again, at that time, we were calling out the things that were uh, no no nos, if you will. But it does say that some new materials may be considered if they convey convey scale and texture similar to that of traditional materials. And so we're kind of keying in on that. Uh, do we want to expand on how that could be used or not? Because that language is there now. And if a reviewer is trying to review a proposal, does that give them enough information about using alternative materials? So, um, whoops. And then lastly is, is roofing materials. And the guidelines do recognize that a, a range of materials uh, does exist. But at the time, it said that metal, plastic, and glass roofs were inappropriate. Now, there have been some proposals for metal roofs. And, and uh, so again, the question is, are they categorically inappropriate or again, with the appropriate detailing and more specific guidance uh, given today's concerns about fire? Uh, is that something to consider? Some of the alternatives are uh, synthetic shakes that ha have a fire rating. This uh, is an example of this polyurethane wood shake or concrete shingles. And in the case of metal roofs, those that are low pr profile, that don't have the really pronounced ridges that, uh, that you may be more familiar with. And so the question here again is, do we want to provide more detailed guidance about these or are we going to categorically so say, no, we want to hold on uh, to the traditional materials? So the uh, activity here is to respond to that. So. You, uh, that's on page 17, and you can uh, discuss this again as a group, and there's sort of a high-level question, and then a sort of a checklist of some of the materials, should we consider those or work on those at all? So that's your next assignment, and then there will be one module after this. So we're, we're doing great. We're right on schedule. We may even actually finish up a little bit early, which would be wonderful, wouldn't it?
So 10 minutes to discuss and five minutes to write. Thank you. 
No, go ahead. Okay, I think we're ready to move into the final module this evening. And that is addressing uh, one uh, zoning code question and this question of 
how design review happens in terms of who, who does it. So the first thing we want to talk about is this um, measuring size three-dimensionally question. And the city has used now for some time a volumetric method that is literally calculating cubic feet, if you will. And it's calibrated in the zoning code. And it has some distinctions between if you have a flat roof or a vertical roof. Uh, but there is a sense that it may be encouraging a, oh, a blank roof, a flat roof um, in the way the calculations work that you, there's a sense that in that peak area, you're getting, that volume is getting counted, but you maybe are not using it. Um, <clears throat> now we're still really running the, te the tests on the, the numbers, but uh, we're, we're, I see a lot of heads nodding. People sense that this <laughs> is true. Uh, and also it, it's just in a complex building form. It, it, it's kind of tedious to calculate too. Um, so are there other alternatives? What, what was the objective there? It was to keep the overall mass down. The other measure that's used somewhat to do that is the floor area ratio. And that's the percentage of square footage of house to the lot size. Uh, and that <clears throat> is well known. There is another tool that we've used called a, a building envelope or a bulk plane or something like that. And while you don't have it on the books, you have a de facto bulk, bulk plane. It is defined by the setback limits of side yards and front yards and the maximum building height. So this transparent blue box that you see here is your behind the scenes building envelope. You cannot build past that. Now, there are some exceptions for encroachments. And lots of codes do that for a variety of reasons. But fundamentally, that is your permitted building envelope. The house you see here, simple though it may be, it probably won't pass design review, but um, it represents the maximum square footage and volume that you can build presently. <clears throat> this is on, on, now there's so many variations in the way uh, things get counted with bonuses and basements and things like that. This is a very simplified form where I'm just building on the surface uh, for, to, to convey this. But the height limits are set by the floor plates, the height, the maximum height of the first floor and the second floor, and then the overall height to the top of the roof, in this case, a peaked one. Uh, and so that is your de facto bulk plane. Well. What is a bulk plane? It is a series of horizontal and vertical planes, which are applied three-dimensionally to set the boundaries of the space that the building may occupy. Now, this particular bulk plane is sculpted. It, has, uh, it rises vertically to a certain point and then slopes inward. That is, the building mass needs to move toward the center of the lot and away from the neighbors. It also, uh, in this particular one, I'm not, I'm not promoting this one, this is just to define it, but this, this one also sets a lower front wall plane and allows wall planes to rise behind it. This one has then at the back a step down secondary form. And it's, it, 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 this uh, was done for a community where having more mass up front and less mass in the back was desired. And that was the, the kind of bulk plane that was established. Oh, so it defines the limit of building. It can be used to shift the mass in. Now this one doesn't have that sloping front plane uh, and it does allow some encroachments. In this case, you see a balcony in, in encroaching, but you can within that design a variety of styles. Now what is key is that that floor area ratio remains in place and is synchronized such that you're not ever able to fill that envelope. Uh, the purpose, the, because then you get similarity, you get a repetitive building form all along the street. So you always want the building envelope to be more than what the allowed square footage is. That way you can move mass around within the limits of the guidelines and other rules and things like that. So these three images all are the same size buildings configured differently within this bulk plane. Um, 
this is another example of flipping that idea of the one you saw earlier, where in this case, there's a lower mass in front. Again, I'm not suggesting that, but just showing that you can begin to define it. If, if one of the goals is to keep things lower in front, this is one way of doing it. Um, you then allow for exceptions, and certainly solar panels these days are the first ones you can think of, but also in a lot of the architectural styles that we encourage, we want dormers uh, to, and they, to allow those to protrude out to make that upper space usable. And they can be tailored to sloping sites as well. It's not a miracle cure and it takes a lot of study. So the question is, do we want to go there or not? Uh, do we want to look at an alternative? And so the, uh, when you get to it, the, the question will be, you know, should we put this on the table to explore in detail or not? And because some people may say, no, I, I know the devil that, that I'm living with now, and I'd prefer to continue that relationship. Uh, the next question is one that's been raised, and that is, should we reestablish a design review board? There was one once. And uh, we've worked with design review boards across the country, and they take on a variety of flavors. Fundamentally, they kind of break down into a couple of categories. Those that actually review and, and determine compliance and approve and issue a permit that allows the design to move through the rest of the permitting processes. They don't necessarily per, uh, issue the permits for say zoning variances and things like that. The planning commission still does that, but they approve the, they use the design guidelines to approve. Others act as an advisory body to a decision-making body. And uh, some of the variables are uh, how, how big is that board? How long do they serve? What are their qualifications, et cetera? So there are a lot of details that would need to be worked out if we were to, uh, to pursue this. The other alternative is to have the planning commission continue to function the way it does in that they consider the design in conjunction with any other variances or special conditions, et cetera, and they make the decisions uh, with the understanding that we're going to be giving them new and improved guidelines. Uh, so those are the fundamentally the three options that we put forward in the online survey. So some of you may say, we've already discussed this. Well, uh, we got this feedback, about 42% prefer to continue with the planning commission. Another 39% liked the idea of an advisory body to the planning commission. And another 19% said, we'd really like the design review board to be a decision maker. Uh, when you combine the two the, of those responses to saying, we want to look at a design review board, you do have a majority of the respondents at least saying, we think some form of the design review board is worth looking at. Uh, so we're, we're re-asking this question to uh, try to drill down a little bit more detail and ask if we were to go that route, what would you see as being the advantages and or what would be the questions you would want answered? Uh, because there are some, some details there that obviously would have to be worked out. So these are the two, and these I know these are, not as fun as the last ones. <laughs> um, and they're getting a bit technical. And so we know that uh, you may not feel comfortable just sort of off the cuff and just saying, I want to go this way or that way. And it's fine if you just want to say, I would need more information and I'm open to seeing this continue in the process and we'll have more conversations. That would be very valuable information. Uh, but we do want to hear what your, what your feelings are. So we'll give you uh, a few minutes on this one. And um, I think it's going to be in aggregate about, about 15 minutes, but you can discuss these. And I think in particular, probably, if you want to discuss one, I would recommend it be this one about the review boards. If you want to talk about uh, any pros and cons, even though the instructions say otherwise, uh, but you may want to you may want to spend a few minutes discussing it. We'll we'll give you about ten minutes uh, here to to or fifteen minutes I think combined to go through these, and then we'll be in the home stretch to wrap up.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I Question? Doesn't. This, you know, this house? No. It's on scenic. Okay. Um, just finished. Uh huh. And done by the most uh, successful architects on the in the area. Mm. And if you look, if you were to take away the built the site, take it off the site, put it on the table, it's a beautiful old specimen, high quality mm -hmm. workmanship. Mm -hmm. Really great design. But it's shoehorned in there. There are houses right next to it. And, it. and so it tells me that this, whatever system the city is using to try to dictate the appropriate proportion of, of lot coverage, this tells me the formula that we're now using has failed. Something's off. But, yep. Because this is just going back it's to the big. 70s. It's too big. 70s, you just had a big box. You mm -hmm. had spec contractors who had to do nothing about the time. Mm -hmm. I'm just specking out the yep. buying property and just building the biggest thing they could possibly. Mm -hmm. Some of them even overhung. They go up on the second floor, overhang uh -huh. the footprint that was yep. designed. Yep. But anyway, this is just a fancy version uh, of those 70s boxes. So there's a loophole that's not being. Well, and the other going. point you're making is you can have good architecture that's out of context. Yes, and, and that makes a bad design. That's right. Because good design yeah. has to be in proportion to the space yeah. that it fills. Yeah. Otherwise, it's bad design. Right. Thank you. 
All right, everybody, no worries going back to the microphone. So, okay. Uh, have you had fun this evening? Uh, I'd be curious as to uh, how you feel about this format. This is a little bit of a different experiment in terms of a workshop. Is this, um, I'm seeing some thumbs up. People like yeah, maybe, maybe give us a thumbs up if you think this was a good, or yeah, yeah claps are good too. Good. You could just, yeah. If you think it's bad, don't use the other finger. Just, yeah. just the thumb up is, yeah. thumb up is good. It certainly enabled us to cover a lot of material more than we could have in a more a conventional kind of hands-on workshop. Uh, the next steps are, and then, and then I'll just sort of ask if there are any other general comments real quickly, since we have a couple of minutes here. You guys have been wonderful this evening. But our next stops are to check in with the Planning Commission and uh, City Council with the, about the strategy paper. And remember, the strategy paper is available online. The copies that are here, you can take. Um, and then based on their direction, you know, they may say, it's a thumbs up as drafted, or they may say, no, don't, don't pursue this one, don't do that one. Based on that direction, we will actually start drafting the design guidelines and uh, delving into some of these more specific zoning code uh, revisions. Uh, our goal is to get a first draft here uh, out for uh, delivery sometime in mid-November to give you advanced time to look at it. And we would come back and review that draft with you. Uh, the target dates right now because of the spaces available is December 12th and 13th. Uh, and maybe we'll do some caroling as well, but uh, <laughs> uh, but 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 that is the goal. Uh, there's a lot to do between now and then. So I'm hoping we can keep on this schedule, but it does say tentative dates, just so you know. So any other, um, oh, and I think there's just, again, a reminder, if you just go to the home site, website, the homepage, you can, you can get this document, the handbook and the, uh, the strategy paper. But any other uh, brief comments this evening? Anyone want to comment on anything? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. And thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for putting this together and for everything being so organized and having people around that we can ask questions is a really great organizational tool. Good. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, Brandon. I look forward to a little bit more information of how we can design our commercial area to accommodate more housing in a respectful way and a traditional way that doesn't um, interfere with the feeling that we have in our downtown, but becomes an enhancement of it. Okay, good. Yep. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to add that when it comes to conveying what people want, what citizens want, what the city wants in response to people who want to build stuff, developers say, and, and home owners who want to build things, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I can't say that strongly enough that the more pictures we show people who want to do things, what we like and what we don't like, the better. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you all. And uh, we will see you in uh, December. Okay. Hold on a second. You don't get to go yet. A couple oh. of housekeeping items. Nice try, Nori. Oh. Um, okay. So first of all, can we have a round of applause for Nori, please? That was wonderful. And Julie, raise your hand. Julie, uh, Julie works with Nori back here. You can get to meet her. Um, I'd like to thank the city team, uh, my team from Community Planning and Building, who came and gave their evening to do this, and Sebastian here from the city as well to do our IT. 
And of course, our steering committee members who came also, thank you to all of you. One more round of applause for them. Thank you. Um, and most importantly, thank you to all of you. This has been in a wonderful, wonderful process. So, oh, it's, this is fun for me. This is fun. Um, so this is not a tip jar, although it's kind of empty. Um, but if you did finish your workbook tonight and you feel like you want to put in, thank you for the, Nancy always ready with the example. Um, if you feel like you want to dump your workbook in here tonight, if you feel like it's done, please do. I'm going to put it up here by the waters, put it in here, only completed workbooks, but take it home. Don't be afraid. You've got a whole week to finish it. When you're done with it, come by City Hall and see us, drop it off at Community Planning and Building. We'll be glad to take it from you. So thanks everybody for coming tonight.